Hi everyone, this is Julian Perez once again uh, from Dental Corp. I am the Vice President of Compliance and Risk Management and I am very honored and privileged to be sitting um, uh, on Zoom, so to speak, with a guest, Dr. Kevin Katz. This is uh, Dr. Katz's seven time, second time with us. Uh, it's been about six weeks, I believe, since we last spoke. Um, and he will be bringing us up to speed again on um, the current state of COVID-19, on um, his experiences uh, at the hospitals where he works, and uh, a couple other uh, issues relevant to dentistry and his work with dentistry. Um, for those who weren't here uh, for the first session, Dr. Kevin Katz is an infectious disease specialist. He's the medical director of infection prevention and control at North York General Hospital. He's the head of microbiology at Sunnybrook Hospital and an associate professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine. Uh, he has served on provincial IPAC best practices committees for many years and has co-authored many of the provincial infectious disease advisory committees best practice guidelines. He has special research interests in healthcare acquired infections and patient safety. Dr. Katz is the chief medical officer of Practice Health Check, an innovative company that provides on-site infection control assessments to ensure Clinics are adhering to best practices and college guidelines. You can visit practicehealthcheck.ca. That's practicehealthcheck, all one word, .ca for more information. Uh, full disclosure, Dental Corp has worked uh, with Dr. Katz and his team in, in many of our clinics. Um, it's been an absolutely uh, fantastic relationship and one that has really uh, improved our own understanding of infection prevention and control. Um, all of uh, the dentists out there who want their clinic to be um, you know, at the forefront of IPAC, I highly encourage you to visit practicehealthcheck.ca uh, to see some of the, the services that uh, Dr. Katz offers. Welcome, Dr. Katz. Uh, so glad to have you again uh, with us this evening. It's great to be back, Julian. Thanks for having me. Um, so for our listeners and our audience, uh, we are pre-recording this. Uh, we've been live most of the times. Uh, with our expert uh, webinar series, uh, but Dr. Katz's schedule has been obviously extremely busy, um, you know, working in two hospitals, um, working in uh, long-term long uh, care homes and retirement homes. Um, so uh, we're really pleased that he was able to carve out some time for us on this long weekend, uh, Saturday evening. Um, again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Katz. And uh, why, don't we, why don't we jump into it? So if you could start off perhaps uh, updating everyone, what's changed over the last six weeks? When we first spoke, we weren't sure how big of a factor asymptomatic spread was. Um, you know, we were concerned that ICU beds might be overrun uh, or that, uh, you know, the capacity ventilators in, in Ontario uh, might not be able to meet the demand caused by COVID-19. Um, where have we come in the last six weeks in terms of uh, pandemic curve here in your uh, your city and, and province? And what else do we need to know? Yeah, so I, I think last time we spoke, we were on the upswing um, on, at the beginning of the upswing, and we were we were really unsure where we would end up. I think we were all holding our breath, hoping hoping things would work out, uh, bending the curve so that we didn't surpass the capacity of the system with the numbers of uh, of patients that were coming in. Um, I think at this point we've, we've passed the peak of the first wave, uh, which is good news. Um, you know, the, the epidemiology across the country is a little bit uh, patchy and different in the different uh, provinces. Uh, there are provinces in the east, in the Maritimes, that have zero cases being reported over the past couple of days, I believe. Um, BC is on, on the downturn quite significantly. Um, Quebec and Ontario seem to be the hot spots, Quebec in particular, and Montreal, the island of Montreal. Um, in Ontario, which I, I know best because uh, that's where I live and work, um, the numbers have uh, come down and stabilized. I, I don't think that we're, we're severely on the downslope. I think we've, we've um, come down and sort of plateaued around uh, two, three, four hundred cases a day. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the number of patients coming into eMERGE, the number admitted to hospital, admitted to ICU on ventilators, those numbers are coming down slowly day by day, which is, which is a really good thing. Um, we weren't completely overrun. I think uh, many ICUs um, were 
full, but because we had turned off some of the elective procedures um, and had capacity in uh, the post anesthetic care units uh, to take more ICU beds and things like that, I, I could say at my own hospital, we did exceed the ICU capacity briefly, but we just tipped into the PACU and, uh, and um, we actually just over the past uh, week, we've closed the PACU back down. So all of the ICU patients are back physically in the ICU. And, uh, and as of uh, early next week, we'll start to reinitiate some of the elective uh, surgeries that had been deferred. There's a huge, huge backlog of uh, elective cases, you know, quote unquote elective cases. I don't think the patients feel they're so elective. When, when we talk about elective, because I have, um, you know, the, the big announcement recently in Ontario and, and in other provinces as well has been that, you know, there will be um, a return of elective surgeries in hospitals. And with that, uh, you know, we expect, um, you know, dental surgeries to commence in, in some provinces. Uh, some have already returned to elective care. Um, what, what are the, when we talk about elective surgeries in, in the hospitals where you work that you're familiar with, um, you know, what are some of the most common categories, let's say? Yeah, I mean, it's probably easier for me to talk about the cases that were being done than the cases that were deferred, because it would be everything else. So, you know, okay. we have A, B, A, B, C, D cases. So the, the A cases are life or limb cases. They have to happen. Otherwise, people will die or lose limbs, you know, quote unquote, that's, they call them life or limb. And so those cases, you know, ruptured triple, triple A's, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms, uh, um, cerebral aneurysms, things that absolutely need to happen because there's not time and it, they need mm -hmm. to be done within a week or two. Those, those were proceeding. Um, some critical cancer surgeries that if they were deferred, um, that would, would lead to uh, negative outcomes, those were being done. But everything else, you know, there were cancer cases that were deferred um, because, you know, if it was a type of cancer that could wait a month and it wouldn't make a huge difference, those cases were deferred. Gallbladders, um, you know, abdominal surgeries. These aren't these aren't cosmetic procedures that were being preferred. These this is a, a huge you know all the hip and shoulder joints and knee joints. All of those are considered elective cases. So, um, you know, people who are hobbling around and can't walk, um, those are considered elective. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, and and now there's going to have to be an attempt to slowly slowly try to get through the backlog. Although even opening up, it's not going to be at full capacity because uh, I don't know if we'll get into it, but there's, there's huge supply chain challenges and uh, reopening ORs. It's, it's not just about the ORs. It has impacts on, on the inpatient pharmacy. You know, we'll use up propofol and paralytics and, and things like that and mm -hmm. PPE, gowns, N95s, um, and on and on and on. Like, so essentially, it'll be a slow and deliberate opening um, and uh, to look for unintended consequences. And the, and the, the government and uh, Ministry of Health have, have a big say in terms of what's going to happen because of all those connected aspects of the supply chain. Yeah, well, well I'm, I'm extremely familiar with some of the supply chain issues we've had in dentistry. Um, and I think we'll get back to that later. So I appreciate you, you mentioning uh, that there are also constraints on um, the supplies that hospitals uh, have and our broader public health system has. Uh, so, one thing that was in the news a lot, and I'm not sure if it was at any of your hospitals, um, so you don't have to get into that if it, if it could be potentially controversial, but we've seen plenty of stories in the news about um, uh, nurses, uh, for example, being asked to uh, extend the use of masks and other PPE, and, and, and in some cases, uh, you know, there, there was a bit of a backlash or, um, you know, I think I saw in one case, one of the nurses union sort of made a statement saying that they didn't feel um, uh, like some of the measures were fair, let's say. Has, has uh, what's been the story with staff on, on the front lines at these hospitals in terms of stress levels and, and, and them having to work in these exceptional circumstances? Yeah, so I mean, there's a whole thing about extended use, reuse, reprocessing of masks, which I thought that's where you were going. We can we can park that, but uh, there's a whole uh, we probably could do you know an hour just on that. But um, in we will, terms we'll of get we'll get back to that. But I think just maybe first, just dealing with the people side of it and, and yeah. the moral side of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I've sort of joked to my colleagues that I wish I wish I had a PhD in psychology because uh, uh, you know I think the the majority of of what's had to be done in the health system over the past six weeks in, in my role um, 
you know, it's not necessarily rocket science in terms of, of um, you know, the principles and, and the things that you need to watch for and put in place, it's, you know, tons of education and training and retraining and re-educating um, and things like that. But I it's think not your one first, of the, it's not your first rodeo, in other words. No, yeah, it's not. A, yeah, it's true. But <laughs> the, the, but the, uh, the staff anxiety, not just staff, I mean, the professional staff, the physicians, uh, the midwives, um, the, the nurses, all across the board, there's just, just an enormous amount of anxiety. And I'm sure you're experiencing some of it already as you're yes. talking about opening up. I, I would imagine as, as dental clinics start to open up more significantly that the, the wave of anxiety uh, and potential anger and, um, um, in, you know, the discussions will be tense uh, around um, making sure that things are safe, that they perceive it as safe, um, mm -hmm. and that things are optimal because people are, are very, very concerned. Mm -hmm. I would say through the journey, um, you know, the, the, the pieces that people tend to focus on the most, and I'm sure you have some questions about it, um, I think the combination of asymptomatics um, that can spread, that's a huge, huge piece. Um, because with SARS and with MERS and with a bunch of these things, it really was when you were symptomatic, you can transmit. When you bring asymptomatics into the, into the game, then really everybody could have COVID and it changes everything. And I've had conversations with anesthetists, with intubations, and then gastroscopists, and then frontline nurses, just all, everyone has uh, concerns. Um, so the, the asymptomatic piece, and then the, the other uh, dirty word, which I, I know is a dirty word in, in dentistry now too, uh -oh. uh, but there's been, there's been songs and jokes written about it um, in my circles, because it's just like, you know, we don't want to talk about it anymore, but it is the thing is, is AGMPs, aerosol generating medical procedures. So the combination right. of asymptomatics and aerosol generating medical procedures, it's, it's, that's a, a really big deal. I mean, I don't, I, I'm sure dentists feel the same way, yeah. Um, and then all of the regulators and all of the ministries that have a, a role in it, the colleges, Ontario Health, the Ministry of Health, and the Ministry of Labor is a huge, a huge piece of it. And, uh, and the union's also a big piece in healthcare. Um, I know there maybe are less unions in, in, uh, in the dental clinic realm, but I think all of the same issues, regardless of unions, um, will, I'm sure, come to the front very, very yeah. quickly. Yeah, safety is, is top of mind. Um, yeah, uh, we've absolutely been, you know, um, dealing with, with staff and I think across dentistry who just want to be reassured to know if they can be reassured, is it safe? How, what will we do to, to um, protect ourselves? Um, you know, so, so it, it's a huge, a huge factor. And you're absolutely right that as people get back to providing um, more aerosol generating procedures, there will be more and more uh, questions. So um, we'll get back. We'll get back to aerosols for sure, because uh, that is it's, you can't avoid that topic now. No <laughs> how much you want to. Um, just on the asymptomatic piece, that was a question that we had uh, when when this was first sort of coming to a head in, uh, in March, and. Um, where are we in the science and the epidemiology on that in terms of, you know, I know that pre-symptomatic is a big issue, uh, which is the same thing effectively as asymptomatic yeah. when you're screening patients. Uh, Perisymptomatic is a word that now I'm becoming familiar with. Um, so is there true asymptomatic spread? Is it, uh, or is it more this sort of mild symptoms and pre-symptoms? Yeah, so I mean, I think you touched on a couple of important pieces, and maybe I'll, I'll just go through them because I'm not sure everybody uh, is as familiar as, as you and I about them. Um, so the, the asymptomatic piece, you can break it up into three main categories. There's the, uh, the pre-symptomatic, meaning that they're asymptomatic when you're seeing them, when you're testing them, when you're caring for them, but they become symptomatic tomorrow or the day after. Um, there's the truly asymptomatics, meaning that you test them, you see them, they're, they're truly asymptomatic, and two, three, four days or a week later, they're still asymptomatic, but they're lab test positive. And then there's the post-symptomatic. So they've had symptoms, um, they've recovered, and you test them, and they continue to be positive by lab test. Um, I, I would sort of call that a post-symptomatic. So the post-symptomatic uh, will leave because those ones are easier. Once they've, you know, they've had COVID, um, um, you can just be cautious and, and keep testing them. and, and 
it's less of a less of a safety concern because you could just err on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. But on on the pre-symptomatic, um, I think it's very clear that these uh, these people are contagious um, and that the the viral loads are high in the early days, just before and as they have mild symptoms, and they clearly can transmit. Um, so that that's obviously a concern because you can't tell when they're asymptomatic. Um, on the good side is you you can as a public health person, you can go and track them down because you find out two days later, so you can try to ring around them and find their contacts and isolate their contacts, hopefully before, before their incubation periods kick in and they also become pre-symptomatic or, or, or actually symptomatic and transmitting. The, the asymptomatics, I, they also can transmit. When you compare, I think they're probably three times less likely to transmit than the pre-symptomatic. So they can transmit, but they're not as contagious. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a little bit of controversy as to what proportion of all cases are truly asymptomatic. And mm -hmm. it probably is, you know, there's been estimates somewhere in the 15 to 18% range, somewhere mm -hmm. other studies looking up to 30%. Depends where you're looking. Some of the cruise ships were on the lower end. Um, and some of uh, some of the other settings were at the higher end, um, but that's not a that's not a small number, and I think the asymptomatics probably also increase as uh, as the, the burden of, of disease goes up in the community. So, for example, when New York City was um, at peak, there was they did some random surveys, um, you know, on, on for example, laboring women who were coming in to deliver babies. So that's you know that's. Random. Yes, they're, interact they're interacting with the healthcare system, but it, they're really well people in the community and just so happens they have to come into hospitals. Mm -hmm. And there was like 13 or 14 percent of all women were positive. Wow. So that, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty impressive number. Um, that is high. Um, and were, yes. they positive, were they testing antibodies or are we saying they were actually shedding virus and they were actively infected at that time? Yeah, so there, there aren't really antibody, there, there are a couple of approved antibody tests. Nobody's really using them because we don't know exactly the sensitivity and the specificity. So we don't know how many false negatives they are or how many false positives, whether it's cross-reacting with human seasonal coronaviruses or not. So a bunch of those studies are taking place. The, the FDA and Health Canada have approved them, but sometimes the, the data um, that's submitted for regulatory approval, when you put it into real life, it doesn't, it doesn't pan out. Like that Spartan cube looked okay when they submitted to Health, Health Canada. And then when they put it in our hands, it was missing a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, positives. So what I'm talking about when I'm talking about testing is uh, molecular testing, reverse transcriptase, PCR, uh, mm -hmm. looking for the RNA. And, uh, and it is RNA. So um, that's, that's the most accessible test. It's the quickest test, um, you know, Purely to, to know about infectivity, you should be doing viral culture. You need cells for that. And, mm -hmm. and the biosafety considerations to do viral culture testing are, are very significantly different um, because mm -hmm. with the RNA amplification tests, you can kill the virus and then mm -hmm. it's safe for the lab techs to work with it um, as a first step. Whereas viral culture, you're actually amplifying the virus. So it actually is, there's a huge biohazard consideration yeah. with it. One can be worked on in a standard hospital lab and the other one needs to be in a special level three lab. And for example, in Toronto, there's probably only two level three labs in the entire city, one at the public health lab, one at the university. Right. And, uh, and across the country, there's not very many. So it's, it's not something that's common and those studies are harder to do. So I, I think... You know, I think at the, at the beginning, when you're finding RNA early on in the course, it's probably live virus. When you start right. getting to the post-symptomatic and somebody's shedding for, you know, three weeks, four weeks, 50 days, you know, maybe some of that is dead RNA. But in the early, early, pre, in the pre-symptomatic, you're on your way to becoming contagious. So that's, that's probably live virus. Um, and the asymptomatics, you find them at a point in time. Um, so if it's early on when they just became positive, that's probably live virus. If, if they're at day 20, 30, then probably it's dead virus, but there's no way to know. So you continue to shed RNA um, uh, for a while after potentially the infection has resolved. You could, you could. I mean, I think we're still learning that there's been studies looking at viral shedding where they take, uh, you know, throat swabs, nasal pharyngeal swabs on a daily basis on patients. It's been reported. Most of, the, most of those studies have been done in young, healthy people. Mm -hmm. And generally, you know, by 10 days, the virus should be gone, including the RNA test. Um, but, 
you know, I, I got my main gig is in hospitals around infection control and I run a big diagnostic microbiology lab. And then we've been working with dental clinics for a while. But as, as the wave was going up, uh, long-term care, uh, for lack of a better word, sort of caught on fire with outbreaks. And so we, we were uh, asked to, to help. So we've been helping a whole bunch of these long-term care homes with their outbreaks. I got to say, older people, um, they shed for a very long time. It hasn't really been reported, but they, you know, we've seen lots of people that are shedding out to 40 plus days. Wow. Wow. Um, so you mentioned 13% uh, potential, like, there, you know, there are maybe up to 13% or more of New Yorkers um, who are infected or have been infected. Uh, do you have any idea what that number would look like for Toronto or for Canada? Um, have we done any large scale random testing uh, similar to that in this country? No, we haven't. So those, for those, you would use the antibody test and you need the antibody test to actually work well. So I think those will start coming. My suspicion is that the percent to, that it would be seropositive or, or have had infection, evidence of infection will be significantly lower in Canada than, like New York had a very significant wave. Their hospitals were overwhelmed. People were dying because they couldn't access ventilators. Uh, you know, they had refrigerated trucks for, for bodies outside. Yeah. Um, and so, the worst case scenario. You know, and, and, yeah, and they, they, they probably have a, a seropositive like, positivity rate somewhere in the 15% range. So it's pretty impressive that only 15% of New York had it and that it was such an impressive wave. And, and here yeah. I'm sure it's lower than that. Yeah, it's a, it's a little scary too uh, at the same time yeah. as it being impressive if, yeah. you know, if the rest of the population is, is still vulnerable. Um, yep. So while we're talking about the virus, I um, just thought we'd run through a couple more uh, sort of technical things that have been in the news that, that are relevant. Um, first of all, just in terms of the, the biomechanics of the virus, can you, I've been hearing a lot about the spike protein. Can you just explain briefly uh, in layman's terms to the best of your ability, uh, what, what, what's the importance of the spike protein in um, uh, the coronavirus? Yeah, so I, I think we've all seen those cartoon pictures on the news or, or wherever, and it's, it's you know, there's this uh, viral capsid, and there's a, it's an envelope virus, so there's a, a lipid bilayer around it, but then there's these spikes that come off, off of the, the surface of the, mm -hmm. of the virus, and, you know, it, it looks like it has a little ball on the top of each, each spike, and and when you look at it, it sort of looks like a corona or a crown around it, which is why mm -hmm. it's called coronavirus in the first place. Under electron microscopy, it looks like it has a crown around it. Mm -hmm. And so those spike, the spike proteins is the proteins that are sticking out at the, at the surface. And the reason why there's interest or why it's important is because, um, it, you know, the spike protein is important for the antigen receptor interactions between the virus and the host in terms of being able to get into cells, firstly. Mm -hmm. But also because it's on the surface of the virus, it's... it's um, probably felt well it is felt to be or it probably is important in terms of uh, the antibody response of uh, the immune system to be able to pro provide some uh, protection against mm -hmm. um, reinfection um, the 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 reason it's I think made the news more um, I mean we use the spike gene within within the actual RNA genome as a you know so, as a target for the test sometimes not at my lab mm -hmm. but some labs use that um, but RNA viruses naturally, as they replicate their RNA, they're known to be much more error prone than mm -hmm. DNA viruses. And so as the RNA genome gets replicated, you know, it'll, it'll insert other base pairs in by accident. So instead of being CCCT, it may go CCTT. And then that, that change changes the protein, which changes the way it folds in the surface. And then the antibodies may not actually um, be able to, to protect against it. And so, you know, now with next gen sequencing, next generation sequencing, whole genome sequencing, um, you know, it used to take years to sequence uh, a genome and, and now you can do it, you know, in two days. And uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable. And what people have found is that there are changes in the spike protein uh, genes or in some places around the world. And so they're concerned that those changes um, may may lead to changes compared to the seed lots in the virus that they were giving to some of the vaccine developers, right? So right. they gave them the original strain, and if the strain changed, they're developing a vaccine to the old strain, they need to move to the new strain, um, and then also whether there would be longer-term immunity. Now, whether that's uh, a significant concern or not is hard, hard to say. You know, those reports are, 
not peer reviewed. A lot of the publications are coming out before they get peer reviewed. Uh, yeah. Just right. So, but but I think that's generally why people talk about spike and and what the concerns are about it. Um, yeah. In terms of uh, you know immunity, I've heard a lot about the human coronaviruses, uh, aka the common cold. And uh, is that if you get the one of those strains of the common cold that's a coronavirus, can you get it again, or are you basically immune for the rest of your life? No, like, you can't get common cold. I mean, if I'm not social distancing, I get the common cold every couple. Yeah, of days. yeah. I mean, the common the common cold is caused by a bunch of things. There's four human coronaviruses that contribute to it. There's a whole bunch of enteroviruses and rhinoviruses and a whole bunch of other viruses, you know, respiratory mm -hmm. viruses that cause the common cold. But specifically, the the four coronavirus strains. Um, if you if you catch coronavirus from your partner, for example, you'll you'll get common cold type symptoms. You probably will be protected for the next, I can't tell you exactly, three, four months. Um, and then your response will wane and you would be susceptible to it again the next year um, or the year after. So it doesn't have long sustained immunity um, like, um, you know, measles, where if you get it once, you have it for, you have your protection for, for the rest of your life. It's mm. not like that. So that's why there's a bit of concern about whether they'll be able to come up with, um, with a vaccine that has um, a long-term protection and then B whether it will actually confer complete protection and uh, and so you know people like me would be very happy if they came out with a vaccine that protects against people getting admitted onto ventilators and dying that would right. be a success but right. you know would that be a success to the anti-vaxxer movement or, or people who sort of um, ascribe to that right I, I, probably not so if it doesn't work perfectly and have zero side effects, then then that would be a problem in terms of uptake. And and for pandemic issues, we do need to have good uptake from a herd immunity perspective to make the waves stop. Yeah, there's definitely risk to rushing in uh, to a vaccine. Um, you know, if, if you get it wrong or cause harm, uh, with you know the potential damage of feeding into the anti-vax uh, narrative, could yeah. you know, cause all kinds of unintended consequences with other. Um, uh, diseases where vaccines are important. So I appreciate that. Um, another thing that's been in the news lately is, is uh, Kawasaki syndrome. Is this something that, that um, you're familiar with and, and are there any cases in Canada? And maybe you can just describe what Kawasaki is briefly as well. Yeah, so, so Kawasaki is, is an inflammatory condition. It tends to affect kids more. So pediatric infectious diseases docs are much more familiar with it than the adult infectious diseases docs. It tends to affect kids under the age of five. And uh, yeah, it, it's a, it causes inflammatory conditions, affects hands and in the mouth and get rashes and big fevers for prolonged periods of time. There's criteria, those are, those are probably four out of the five, there's criteria that you need to meet. Um, the concern is that some of the inflammatory issues can also affect the coronary arteries around the heart so that you can end up with aneurysm. Like if you inflame the coronary arteries, you can end up with aneurysms, not of the heart, but of the actual small coronary arteries. Mm -hmm. and uh, and so, so, you know, it is a very serious issue. They treat it with IVIG and, and uh, aspirin. Mm -hmm. um, and COVID, it's associated with other viruses, and, and it does seem to be associated with COVID-19 as well. Um, and uh, and I, I definitely know that there has been at least one case, because I, I know of one case, but um, I'm sure there must have been others as well. Okay, but in terms of, uh, you know, the, the numbers or, or the, the level of risk to children still seems to be pretty low. Um, if you've only seen one and we've probably had thousands of kids get this, I would imagine by this point. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I should say in general, kids are, there's not really an issue with kids. I mean, these are, these are rare things that happen um, under the age of, if we look at the outcomes uh, of COVID-19 by age category, there was a nice paper early on came out of China, the Center for, Centers for Disease Control in China. And uh, they had about 70,000 people that they described in this one paper. And uh, essentially under the age of 18, the mortality and the outcome, the mortality is like zero and uh, the outcomes are very good. And actually there's, there's quite rare descriptions of presentations in kids. So they almost don't even get symptoms at all. Um, it, it, as you move into middle age group, um, you know, somebody who's in their mid forties, the mortality rate is somewhere in the 0.4, range. Mm -hmm. um, and then as you go up to 70 or 80, the mortality rate for confirmed positives would be 
um, somewhere in the 15 to 20 percent range. And I mean, the issue is those numbers may be slightly high estimates because there may be more asymptomatics that weren't uh, weren't mm-hmm. known about there. Those are of lab confirmed positives, mm-hmm. um, although they were testing pretty broadly at one point in in China. Um, so maybe those maybe those mortality estimates are on the high side overall all ages together and again under 18 there's almost nothing um, but all together you know the estimate somewhere in the two-ish percent range but uh, you know in some countries it's been as high as 10 percent of lab percent lab mm-hmm. confirmed and is it is it that their lab testing was only testing the very severe ones that are ending up in hospital was it because they completely got overrun and didn't have enough ventilators um, because it's not that you can't support them through it. It's if you don't have a ventilator, they just die. Um, and yeah. so I, I think when, when all is said and done and we have uh, a good antibody test to see what the denominator is, I think some of these mortality assessments will change. Um, but, uh, but, but this isn't exactly like the common flu. There's no question. It's, in my mind, right. it's, it's actually very different from that. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, of, of these numbers, then, you know, I, I recently read that uh, this year in the United States, it was a really bad year for influenza. Um, and I'm not sure what the numbers were, but I think it was around almost 80,000 people um, uh, in the U.S. died this year of influenza, which is close, close to the number for COVID-19 so far, which is, I mean, COVID-19 has a long way, unfortunately, um, to go. But um, just, in, you know, if people already have some baseline immunity and there have been a lot of, you know, uh, vaccines to influenza, uh, do you think there's a chance we'll look back and think that, you know, the mortality rate or see that the mortality rate for COVID-19 is similar to some of the uh, strains of flu or do you think it, 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 it's higher? I mean, it's calling yeah. up, asking you to look, see into the future. and <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, if we look at flu, the overall mortality of flu is in the 0.1% range. And under, under the age of 60, there's almost 0% mortality and all of it is in the elderly at risk group, which is, which is true for COVID, although there is some middle age morbidity and mortality as, as I sort of touched on a little bit for COVID. Um, but I think we need to understand how they get these estimates for flu, right? So people don't test for flu very well. So the way that those estimates, when we say that there's 6,000 deaths in Canada or 80,000, 10 times in, in the US. So that's not all lab confirmed flu deaths. That's, that's looking at over the flu season, how many mm. more people die than during non-flu season, and then inferring how much of that relates to flu. Mm. So, so it's not, these aren't lab confirmed flu cases. And you know, if we just look at what happened in, in New York State, New York City, over a six week period, March, April, um, uh, don't quote me exactly on the numbers, but they're in the right ballpark. Um, so, so I think in 2018, I had looked up that uh, flu in New York State, there was about 4,500 deaths. That was a bad and, year as well. Yeah, and, and 2,000 2, of them were in New York City. So mm-hmm. similarly, for the six-week period of, of COVID, there was about 20,000 deaths with COVID. And um, and that was lab confirmed. And then there was another 5,000 that uh, were highly suspected, but didn't actually get confirmed before they passed away. And then there was a report on CTV a, a week or so ago that essentially just looked at what is the excess mortality over normal that happened during that six week period. And they right. added another five or 6,000 just for that. So, right. you know, it's not uncommon that people have sort of flu-like symptoms, and then they just drop dead at home. And those right. aren't necessarily called COVID deaths, but at one point, we're gonna go back and reevaluate, reevaluate all the numbers. Right. I suspect the COVID death numbers will go up. Yeah. Maybe the percentage will go down because the asymptomatics will expand too. But there's no question, this is, this is not the flu. And remember, these numbers are with society, sheltering at home yeah. and not working, yeah. right? So this is, right. this is not the flu. This is not no. the flu. Anybody who says it's the flu, it's not. Yeah, I, I, I had to ask that question uh, because, you know, there, a lot of people are, are wondering, is this, have we overreacted? Right, yeah. And, and when it comes, you know, uh, with, with most of my family from New York uh, and lots of my friends and most of my family are in New York and, um, you know, they don't feel like they've overreacted there, especially yeah. 
New York City, um, and, and it's, it's been a huge disruption to their lives as well. Um, so we're going to move on uh, from the uh, virology section of our <laughs> uh, uh, We can come back to it uh, if necessary, but um, I wanted to talk about uh, some of the more um, dental specific elements of uh, COVID-19 and uh, getting back to work and, and, and what things will look like. So I think um, a good transition would be this question. Uh, what does the future hold? Is there going to be, is the summer, does the sunshine kill the virus and it's going to go away until the fall? Is there going to be a second wave when people start to relax and see their friends at barbecues or when kids go back in September? What do you, what do you think is a likely scenario um, for the next six months? Well, six months, I think, is easier. Over the summer, <laughs> over the summer, I, I, I think it's a, a hard question. So if you look at some jurisdictions like uh, New Brunswick PEI that are down to zero and they start to relax social distancing, they may have a better go of it because there's not a lot of virus around to actually flare up. Although, you know, with, with movement and, and, you know, as they start increasing claims and shipments and uh, people move around, I think there'll be reintroductions. So if people are social distancing well and there's not much virus around, I, I think it may go okay for those jurisdictions. I think if you look at, you know, like a Quebec or an Ontario where there's, there's high densities of people and the numbers are really not that low as it is, there's a lot of pressure to open things up. And, you know, people are people, you know, they're not, they're not all, uh, you know, regulating themselves like public health officials. Yeah. Um, you know, if there's virus around and people are congregating, it's pretty catchy. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's little flares here and flares there in specific circumstances. And then the question is how, how strong is public health to be able to contact, contact trace and get these things back under, under control. Um, so over the summer, I, I think it'll sort of be rocky, sort of start, stop, start, stop type of uh, problems. Um, I'll comment on the fall in a second, but just in general in pandemic planning, I, you know, I've engaged in it for, for probably a decade or more. And you know, it's, it's well known and, and people say it, if you read any classic pandemic planning, that second and third waves can be more severe than the first wave. And, and it's interesting, as I live through it, I've come to the conclusion that the reason that that is, is not, I've always thought it was maybe the virus mutates and it becomes mm -hmm. more virulent. I actually think the reason that the second and third waves become more severe is because the population is pooped out and they're, they're done with social distancing, they're yeah. done with shutting in place. And, uh, and you just have to look at what's happening in the States, you know, where there's like riots to get to the beach and, uh, and mobs and things like that. So there's no question when people are interacting with each other and a virus is circulating, it amplifies and amplifies. And, you know, by the, what we're seeing today happened, you know, a week, two weeks ago. So by the time you're like, oh, crap, there's a problem, you still have another two weeks of right. increases and it doubles every sort of three or four days. So you know, two weeks from now, you could be um, hundreds of percents higher in terms of numbers. So, um, yeah, I hope this summer is quiet. I suspect that by the fall, there'll be a problem as, you know, respiratory viruses tend to flare in the fall. It's not exactly clear why, if it relates to cold and people being indoors or yeah. humidity levels or, or what. But um, I, I do think that there, we will have another, another go at this. And I'm a bit nervous that society in general and governments and everybody are a little bit fatigued from it and uh and the, the, ne the next time they may not pull the trigger quickly and that uh that we may end up uh not not having the the, the moment that we need to, to get it under control again so so there's precedent for the second wave being worse um yeah. it, it may be because of uh human social dynamics as opposed yeah. to uh the fact that we've been un un lucky with mutations in the past. I know that, uh, you know, with the pandemic of, of uh, all pandemics, at least in terms of uh, modern history, last hundred years, the Spanish flu had a particularly vicious second wave. Um, so hopefully, hopefully we won't see a repeat uh, of that. I know Spanish flu, obviously the, the mortality rate was quite a bit higher, but, um, you know, hopefully the same pattern won't hold true. So, so you know, you mentioned that Perhaps the fall, the winter, um, you see these flare-ups because people are tend to be inside more. Um, and so I think that that might be a good transition just to talk about some of the engineering controls that um, 
uh, have been discussed lately in dentistry and uh, there's been a variety of approaches to regulation to getting back to work and again you know um, when you're talking about different provinces with with uh, extremely uh, divergent prevalence rates that you know the different approaches make sense but um, the the companies uh, the supply companies and, and uh, technology companies that market to, to dentistry have been having a field day pushing <laughs> some products some of them maybe um, you know the right solution but I'd like maybe for you to talk about the um, approach hospitals have taken to uh, you know uh, air changes per hour and dealing with um, you know the HVAC systems and stuff like that because I know hospitals are, are quite different than your typical dental office but I think it might be instructive just to hear how you guys have approached that. Are you using HEPA filters? You know, um, do you use UV lights and the like in operatories? Uh, what are yeah. some engineering controls? Yeah, so, I mean, a couple of things just about COVID in general. So, so just at the beginning, if you remember, at least in Ontario and Quebec, I think the, the rest of the, country, the provinces in the country uh, were using droplet masks the whole time. Ontario and Quebec, based on the precautionary principle, just for all routine care. Like if I was mm -hmm. examining a patient, taking care of them, I was wearing an N95 mask. I, I think it's become clear that just the routine care of patients, that droplets, droplet precautions, droplet contact precautions are okay, which essentially means um, a droplet mask, surgical mask, or procedure mask, a visor or goggles, gowns and gloves, and, uh, and that that's sufficient um, and that there's not, um, not aerosols or airborne transmission from, uh, from this. It's like, re like regular influenza. Um, I think the, you know, that dirty word that I talked about, the, the one that everyone keeps talking about and everyone's concerned about is these aerosol generating medical procedures. And, and so these are procedures like intubations or BiPAP or there's a whole bunch of them where essentially you're, you're applying positive pressure and it's the act that's being done that's actually um, generating um, smaller droplets. And, and I think we talked about last time, the large droplets and the small, smaller right. droplets. Right. Large droplets fall within within two meters or six feet, which is why droplet precautions are fine. And right. then when you get to small droplets, that they're so small that they can just sit on air currents and just you know hang out in the air. Like and dust, you, you see dust hanging in the air, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and there's only a couple of, you know, there's only a couple, there's only three or four um, common uh, infections that we know of clearly, clearly are airborne transmitted like measles and chicken pox and TB mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Um, and so the, the question is, these aerosol generating medical procedures, do they just propel droplets further or do they actually make small droplets that can sit on air currents? And I think that's an unknown question, but it, it causes a ton of, of fear. And I think, you know, we have a duty to protect workers. And so a lot of, a lot of the planning around it is, is um, you know, assuming that, that, um, that these droplets may behave in a different way and therefore we use N9, fit, net, fit tested N95 respirators or higher, some people say, you know, PAPRs, mm -hmm. although mm -hmm. a lot of hospitals aren't, aren't doing that, or P99s and things like that. Um, and then for airborne diseases like measles or TB or chickenpox, the air exchanges becomes a big thing. And, and the rooms, these airborne isola infection isolation rooms, AIIR, mm -hmm. um, they're designed to be negative pressure to the hallway. So when the patient's in the room, Essentially, the hallway air is, there's a door with sweeps on it, mm -hmm. and the air is being pulled around the seal of the door into the room. Mm -hmm. um, the bathroom door is left open, and essentially the, the outtake of the exhaust is through the bathroom, and you're pulling air in from the hallway out through the bathroom, and there's a required number of air exchanges to meet the category of AIIRs. Um, and there's sort of old build and new builds, but yeah. essentially, you know, you're sort of in the, in the 50, 12, 15, 20 air exchanges an hour. And then there's these tables from the CDC or Health Canada that can tell you um, that after a certain number of minutes that you've replaced 99 or 99.9% .9 of the air in the room. And uh, so for example, if we had uh, a TB patient in the room and, and they went for a procedure and we wanted to have an environmental cleaner go and clean in the room, um, based on the knowledge of the air exchanges, and this is done by engineers who do this, you know, for a living. We don't, right. we don't just guess. We don't guess it. It's um, reassuring. Next time I have a surgery, I'll be, I'll be reassured. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, essentially, like if we knew there was 20 air exchanges in the room, then uh, within about 21 minutes, 
the all of the air in the room has essentially been replaced. And then those cleaners can go in without an N95 mask. Otherwise, they need to go in with with the full personal yeah. protective equipment to protect themselves. Yeah. So these AGMPs, I, I think there still is a question of whether it's truly airborne or whether it just propels droplets further. Um, but it, it's a it's a huge issue for a number of reasons. Obviously, there's we talked about supply chain. There's not a lot of N95s in the system, and they're not coming soon. Um, yeah. So that's that's an important consideration. In dentistry, obviously, a lot of the clinics are open, open uh, um, setups. You know, they're right. beautiful, but they're, they're right. open setups, that, and they don't have doors. They don't always have walls that go to the ceiling. Um, and so there's there's these factors, and then the staff are extremely right. nervous, right? And the staff want everything done. And I can tell you, um, my staff know exactly what's happening in. Ottawa and Hamilton and right. DC, Vancouver, yeah. any document that says to do more, they know about it and I'll hear about it immediately. And, uh, and staff are, 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 have a very low threshold to call the Ministry of Labor if they don't feel safe. They'll, they'll say that they're gonna work refuse, call in the Ministry of Labor. And the Ministry of Labor is, is very, um, very pro uh, worker. I wouldn't say pro labor, but they're pro worker. Um, and the ministry well, of that's their, their job, at least that's one of their jobs is to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So safety. they can come in and shut things down. They can write orders and, and enforce as at will. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, we've been, we've been lurching back and forth because we want to make sure we have enough PPE to, to protect for the critical situations. The nurses have been arguing they want N95s for everything. And so we want mm -hmm. to at least have N95s for the HMPs. Um, that's been the priority, if not if not just for routine care, because that's yeah. been pretty clear. So, so when we're talking about, and I don't, I don't know that every hospital is the same, or, um, or that every city or province has taken the same approach from, you know, uh, public health uh, chief medical officer, but when you talk about N95s and AGMPs, um, previously you alluded to some controversy around extended use, reuse. When we talk about uh, reuse of, of uh, N95s, would they be reused for multiple AGMPs or are we talking about reuse in other contexts? Yeah, so it, it is a little bit controversial. Let me first say that I'm not, I'm not a regulator. I don't work for public health. I'm not okay. able to give you permission to, uh, to right. do anything that's off-label and all of these things are 100% off-label. And right. uh, the Ministry of Labor, Public Health may come in and have very different views, but I can tell you right. the context, at least in Ontario. Um, so I think that there's an acknowledgement that there's a shortage of N95s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the Ministry of Health and Ontario Health essentially have told hospitals to start to collect N95s, not to discard them, mm -hmm. um, and to start to look into reprocessing N95s. Uh, but they haven't given the go-ahead to actually do that. And uh, they're strongly discouraging actually um, using a reprocessed N95. So at this point, we have systems in place that we've, we've just put in place to collect them. Um, and um, well, there's different ways you can reprocess it and essentially just to sort of store them so they're not in landfill and that we have them. Um, and, you know, there's a bunch of research that's coming out. Some of it's from Canada, Winnipeg, the National Microbiology Lab. They've done a bunch of testing. Um, around Sterad, which is hydrogen peroxide plasma systems, um, and autoclave, and some of the N95 models are tolerating one, some are tolerating the other, some tolerate both. Um, there's publications out of the Netherlands and other places uh, similarly, and, and the data looks very mass specific, so, so don't interpret, uh, right. like if I say you can go through an autoclave cycle, it doesn't mean like 82 tens. Yeah, 8210s and 1860 do not go through autoclaves, but uh, 9210s and 1870s do do go through autoclaves. I'm, ta I'm taking notes here because you know in the dental office we have autoclaves. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and the, and the cycles on a slightly lower temperature. Anyways, but um, so th there's data showing that the the fit test, quantitative fit tests, um, work well. It's very mask by mask and reprocessing method by reprocessing method. So I think if we were in, in dire shortage and running out and we were still doing these AGMPs, I think having something is better than nothing firstly. And then the data is accumulating to say that it does, um, it does uh, work. Um, you know, these are single use medical devices. So it's off label by definition. And I think a lot of places are, are anxious 
to pull the trigger and then if something happens um, to, to, you know, from an insurance perspective and things like that. Um, so it would be a, a last resort uh, thing. So that, that's sort of the background of actually reusing them. Uh, what we are doing though, is we are doing extended use of N95s. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so essentially, um, it, if you put it on, you can wear it for a prolonged period of time. Um, many places so you just you put it under your chin when between patients then right no no yeah. yeah you should never put masks uh you know down you should never dangle them off of you you just end up contaminating yourself so essentially you keep it on that's prolonged use there's reuse where you can take it off and then put it back on um and uh part of me is hesitant to even tell you how to do these things because people will, will sort of do it and do it incorrectly but you assume that the surface of the mask is contaminated um, and so places were, were extending the use, as long as it was covered with a visor, then the surface of the mask was said to be clean and you can wear it for a prolonged period of time. Um, many places were using it for multiple patients like that. Although some of the new documents uh, out of Ontario are saying if you've used it for an AGMP, it should be discarded. Um, so that, that has just come out in the past week and it's caused a little bit of a kerfuffle because a lot of places were not doing that um, are not doing that and it would lead to a much higher burn rate of N95. So there's been a lot of pushback on it. Um, I'm not, yeah. first of all, you know, um, as the, uh, the, you know, head of the regulatory compliance department for uh, 400 plus dental offices, just want everybody to know that, you know, we follow our provincial regulators uh, and that's the dental regulator, the hygiene regulator, the uh, Ministry of Health, Public Health and, and um, chief medical officers who are all uh, issuing guidance. And so that's at the end of the day, you know, the, the, what we're um, going to hold ourselves to, but it's extremely interesting to hear, you know, what, what's happening in other contexts. And, you know, especially when you're up against, like you said, these life or life or limb procedures, because maybe some things for truly elective care, the, the cost benefit analysis might be different than when you're dealing with a procedure that, that uh, has to happen and, and that's the best PPE you have. So, um, yeah, but that, that's why those elective procedures, that's why they're not just saying, okay, open them up and do, you know, go from two ORs to 15 ORs a day. Um, it's, it's actually because the people, it's not because there's not the people to do it or the nurses to do it, or the doctors or the nurses or anybody. It, mm. It's, it's the PPE and the drugs and you know, the, the anesthetic agents and all of everything's on in short supply. Um, and, uh, and I think everyone's thinking that there will be another, another wave and, and, you know, we need to, we need to maintain the supplies because it's not like there's plane loads coming with new supplies. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, some of the plane loads have brought supplies that didn't, um, yeah. turn the way we had hoped as well. And that's been a real challenge, I think for dentists as well. Um, it is, uh, all of a sudden navigating, um, uh, international uh, irregular supply chains for extremely rare and highly coveted uh, PPE and we're competing with hospitals and, and other countries and um, there are now a lot of brokers who are new players in the healthcare industry and it's been uh, quite the roller coaster here fortunately we have uh, you know an amazing procurement team um, and and they don't need to sleep anymore <laughs> Oh, um, yeah, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Nick Pakitis, who is our, our VP of uh, procurement here, who has been truly a 24-7 hero. But um, it's been extremely, extremely challenging. And, uh, you know, den dentists, and, and you have dental clients, so you've been hearing about this, but um, trying to get the right PPE for, you know, aerosol procedures is what we do. Um, at least it's a big part of what we do. So without that in certain provinces, it's, it's a big uh, bottleneck. So, um, you know, yeah, let, let me just comment on that. I've been, I've yeah. actually been saying, I've spoken to my, my counterparts, you know, the heads of infection control at major academic centers in, in Ontario. And I got to tell you, I actually think that our aerosol generated medical procedures, when I say our, I, I play on both sides. I work with dentists a lot. I don't think there's many like me who do. Um, but the, the hospital side, the AGMPs are, you know, 50% of the risk of what they are in the dental clinics from my perspective. Um, you know, when we, when we intubate somebody, people are really nervous about it, but we, we actually paralyze the person with drugs so that they're effectively not breathing, not coughing, not sputtering. 
and then we can use video laryngoscopes to insert tubes so you're not even close to them you're actually a foot two foot three feet away um, and so those those AGMPs are much lower risk than in dentistry we're using high speed uh, hand pieces ultrasonic scalers and things like that and it's interesting on a call I sort of said to my colleagues and they were oh yeah they were all uh, very very concerned around um, the procedures in dentistry being a much higher risk and, and um, on, on the scale of, of uh, aerosol generation, I, I don't think that they're in the same ballpark. It, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and the other thing is we don't have a lot of robotics in dentistry still, right? So it's that it's, um, you're really uh, in close proximity with the patient um, for, right. for a lot of the procedures. You know, um, you know endodontists sometimes with, the, with the mic their microscopes can, can get a bit more um, removed from the field of, of work, but you are very close. And for me, you know, that, that's one of the, when we're talking about, you know, masks and, and assuming that the surface of the mask is contaminated, I think you really have to assume that it's contaminated when, you know, you're, you're in that kind of proximity to the aerosols that you're creating. And, and so, you know, one thing that I've been trying to emphasize is uh, PPE compliance, right? So I think a lot of people have been focusing on wearing the uh, proper PPE and, and mm -hmm. we're all we're shifting our focus as we get back to work to wearing the PPE properly. Um, and so, you know, in, I, and I don't know, if, you know, if you have a lot of OR side experience when it comes to um, uh, surgeries and PPE, but like if somebody would touch their mask, you know, ho you know, hopefully a nurse would say, you know, you're, you're your gloves are contaminated and and it's that kind of culture shift I think that will hopefully improve safety some extent to, to, to the extent possible in dentistry it's just realizing understanding the pathways um, really really um, uh, caring and understanding the pathways of transmission because there's a lot we can do to cut down on the risk but we have to yeah. be aware in all of those moments as well when when you yeah. know, can be cross-contaminated a hundred percent. I think, I think the way that you wear the PPE is critical. Um, obviously wearing it in the first place is critical. Necessary, and, then, yeah. and then it's, it's actually extremely important how you take it off, how you doff the PPE. I think people underestimate that. There's, there's good studies from SARS-CoV-1 back in 2003 that a lot of the transmissions related to how you take the gear off. So they were wearing a 95 mask, but there were still transmissions and it related to, to contaminating themselves as they were getting the gear off. And so a lot of what we do in, in our hospitals, but also in clinics is making sure that staff know, have, you know, have been trained and educated, but also go through the motions of taking it off, have a, a safety buddy system to take it off properly, um, coach each other. Um, and these things are, by the way, are extremely important as it relates to the Ministry of Labor because um, they require documentation to show that you've educated, to show that you've trained the staff, um, around the proper use of PPE. Um, I'm sure, you know, I've spoken to dentists and doctors for, for years, and I don't think people really know the occupational health and safety legislation that exists. And in that mm -hmm. legislation, there are requirements for the employer, and there are requirements for the supervisor, and sometimes mm -hmm. the supervisor and the employer are the same group or the same person, and then for the employee. And, and a lot of the employer supervisor responsibilities are around providing the right PPE, providing the right systems, the engineering controls, and also all of the training and education. And it, it's not just on your word, it's actually you know, proving that you've, you've done it. So you have the, the education sessions with signatures, documenting the times and the dates and things like that. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with you. Using it properly is, is uh, just as important as having it. Yeah, and, and it's, you, know, you mentioned the Ministry of Labor a couple of times and um, I, I, you know, as the head of regulatory compliance, we, we deal with you know regulators for hygienists, dental assistants in many provinces for dentists, obviously, and we also deal with public health and you know the privacy commissioner and there's a whole constellation of regulators. The Ministry of Labor has always been there, uh, you know, but I think that they're going to uh, become more of a presence uh, in in my world as the head of uh, uh, the regulatory. Um, aspect here so um, it's really important I think for us and, and fortunately we have an HR team uh, that, that has created an amazing health and safety program but uh, you know I think it's it's going to be incumbent on everybody in dentistry especially supervisors and, and uh, employers to really understand that that um, 
uh, legislation and also to carefully read the back to work documents that their colleges are publishing because they say a lot about your requirements for to your staff now to the safety of your staff and and you know to work safe for the Ministry of Labor so um, it's going to be a very interesting next uh, few months a year a couple of years uh, to see how this all shakes out for sure. So just um, wrapping up a little bit, we've, we've sort of bounced back and forth between engineering controls and PPE, which is natural um, because those are both kind of um, mitigation uh, efforts. Um, but uh, I just want to touch on a couple of these engineering controls that we have uh, uh, been hearing about. One is the UVC lights. Uh, so these are lights that you can uh, put on hopefully when nobody is around because my understanding is uh, the, the sort of industrial UVC lights that exist might not be uh, particularly safe for human uh, eyes and skin. Um, yeah. Is that something that's common in hospitals? Do you use it to disinfect um, uh, medical devices or PPE? Do you use it to disinfect operatories <clears throat> or not? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's two ways two ways to use UVC. Sometimes in HVAC systems, they add UVC into the HVAC systems as an additional. There'll be HEPA filters and then uh, sometimes there'll be UVC light, but it's not required. It's not common actually. Mm -hmm. um, then there's uh, UV light um, as an added layer to after environmental cleaning. And I think it's important to, to really stress that UV light does not replace environmental cleaning. So after you have a patient, you've done a procedure, you need to wipe down all of the horizontal surfaces, anything the patient touched, anything your hands touched, anything that the equipment touched, all needs to be wiped down with a hospital grade disinfectant, nice and wet. The wipes need to be nice and wet because the, the wet contact time is what leads to killing of the virus. It's actually mm -hmm. quite an easy thing to kill with any of these hospital disinfectants. It's not very resistant, but it needs to be in contact with disinfectant. Wet, wet, wet. Yeah, it needs to be wet for like a minute plus okay. 90 seconds depending okay. on which chemical. Um, so it doesn't replace that. And once you've done that, you don't necessarily need the UV light. Um, mm -hmm. So the, in hospitals, sometimes we do have those machines, but um, it's, th there's been cost effectiveness analysis and there's also been just overall efficacy. And it, it, it's been shown in the lab that it can reduce viral loads and reduce bacterial loads but it hasn't been shown to reduce healthcare associated infections, which is the ultimate outcome that we would like right. to see. And so it's actually not widely recommended um, at this point, mm -hmm. although people do use them sometimes. So I wouldn't, if you're gonna go and buy something, I wouldn't go buy that. And, and it, by the way, the, the UVC light is carcinogenic. Um, right, UV that's light. important so, for people to know. Because yeah, it's being so, so you can't just leave it on, you have to be out of the room. Um, if I was going to spend money, I probably would spend money on increasing air exchanges. On, okay, there's awesome. a bunch of things. There's, you know, high, all the things that the colleges are talking about. Right. High flow evacuators, uh, outside the mouth, inside the mouth, um, right. uh, washes, dams, right. all right. of that thing. And then air exchanges would That's be big another big one. Um, negative pressure to the hallway usually says, if possible, in the hospital documents. Um, so if I was building a new clinic, I know right. what I would do in a new clinic. Going forward, yeah. pay attention. <laughs> so. Yeah. If I, if I was building a new clinic, I think the incremental cost is a no-brainer to add it in. For, for older clinics, um, you know, I know, I know these things are expensive. Um, but, you know, how, how I weigh it out is, firstly, let me say, this isn't going away. Like dental... Dentists are installing, you know, zipper doors, plastic, and tents, and like all this crazy stuff. These things are for a month, for two months, for six weeks. This isn't going away um, anytime soon. You know, I would be very shocked if into 2021, the beginning of the, the first quarter, if we're not still dealing with this. Um, okay. So, you know, doors and ceiling rooms for the AGMPs, doing that in a very temporary way. Um, can increase fire hazard issues and and may may impact on airflows the way your office was designed for the normal HVAC. So, mm -hmm. you know, getting getting HVAC engineers to make sure that you're not worsening the situation um, right. and that you're improving the situation. Ultimately, I've been on a journey that many many of you haven't been on. Um, at the end of the day, you want to keep your staff coming to work, um, yeah. and and the staff are very very anxious. I wouldn't underestimate that. Um, maybe maybe you'll have a lucky clinic where your staff are really gung ho, but um, I haven't met very many people that aren't anxious. And so, 
you know, if, if, if I were to set up my clinic so that it's, it's uh, you know, running well and the staff have full confidence, they've been trained and they feel they have the systems in place and the engineering controls, the HVAC, um, my staff will keep coming and yeah. maybe your staff will come work for me. And on top of it, I don't have to wait three hours to turn over my room in Ontario. I could probably turn it over in 21 minutes, um, yeah. which is an economic issue. So keeping staff and keeping flow is, is I wouldn't underestimate it. And, and you know, capital costs going to be amortized over a number of years. So I'm not saying everybody has to do it, but I, that's probably the way that I would calculate it out if I was, if I was doing it. Yeah. Well, with your background, I'm, I'm not surprised. Um, yeah. yeah. That, it makes sense. And so, so I appreciate that. Uh, and, and these are exactly the issues that the profession is wrestling with. Um, and, and so it's, it's great to have your insights on that. And, you know, uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit just um, on the engineering controls because there's still a couple others that, that people have been talking about. And so I appreciate you mentioning pre-procedural rinses. I think it, the go-to in Canada seems to be hydrogen peroxide, although um, I've heard uh, and seen studies saying that there are other effective rinses potentially, um, but there maybe just aren't the studies to, to support it. But that, you know, from, <clears throat> you know, virologists are saying, well, these other things should, would probably work. We just haven't had a study with COVID-19 that proves it yet. Right. Uh, yeah, the rubber dams, you know, in terms of isolating, um, you know, uh, removing the saliva so you can't aerosolize the saliva, capturing it. <clears throat> These are all, you know, proven and effective uh, technologies. A new one that I've been hearing about is this fogger technology. And I guess there are different types of uh, antiviral agents that you can turn into an aerosol or a fog and then spray a, a patient treatment area to try to um, you know, get the aerosols out of the air, and, and I guess the, um, you know, hydrochloric, hypochlorous acid, I think is, or uh, HOC acid, yeah. one that I've seen, and, um, uh, you know, hydrogen peroxide is another one, that, that a fogging agent that people are using. Are these things that are common in hospitals, uh, you know, to turn over operatories? <clears throat> um, yeah, not, not really. So, um, I, I think just good old environmental cleaning with, uh, you know, a hospital grade disinfectant and, you know, wiping down surfaces is mm -hmm. adequate to deal with this. I don't know that these fogging agents that anyone would say that they can actually clear them out of the air. I don't, that's not the way that they're to be used. These are for surfaces. Um, hydrogen peroxide vapor, there are good studies that, yeah, that could work. But generally, you know, a lot of the dental clinics aren't closed up and don't have doors and don't have ceilings to the walls. So Hydrogen peroxide vapor, you need to have all of that and you need to actually seal the air vents before you use it too. So it's not an easy thing to use just so there's a one-off here or there. Uh -huh. um, and then the uh, hypochloric acid, um, you know, chlorine, bleach, it, free chlorine is what, what the killing agent is there. It does work very well. Um, no one's using fogging uh, with that product in any healthcare facility that I'm aware of. And, and you don't really need to fog, you just need to actually wipe every surface down like you would normally do um, right. to turn the room over. And, and I wouldn't underestimate after an AGMP that the surfaces are definitely an issue and do need to be wiped down yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is about, you know, we talk about aerosols and, and uh, uh, all the aerosols in the air, but when you're doing an aerosol generating procedure, there's large droplets as well. It's not one or the other. Right. It's a combination. And then from there, you've also got the, the fomite, right? So then it rests somewhere and, and then there's you know potential for a patient to come sit put their hand where the previous patient's hand was and all of that other work you've done and all that PPE. Yeah yeah I mean and, and yeah so you, you mentioned the patient I don't think we've talked about it and people sort of forget about it so I don't want to go off on it. I don't forget about the patient. <laughs> yeah, right yeah yeah well you and I but are it, patients, right? Um, so it, it you know a lot of the focus is on protecting the staff in the clinics and protecting the staff in the hospitals but the other thing we, we don't want is to transmit it to patients yeah. um, those patients will become positive in the community then public health will come knocking because they had a procedure um, and uh, a couple of things there yeah the environmental cleaning is really important um, the patient not going into the room before the the uh, the appropriate uh, air exchanges if, if you know in some provinces are saying it some aren't um, and then um, there's also issues with the mask. So a lot of people are just taking any mask they want. So if you get N95s which have those little exhale valves mm -hmm. on them, 
those exhale valves, so, so essentially what they do is when you inhale, it goes through the filter. When you exhale, it lets you just breathe out through the valve directly. Right. So it's because there's it takes a little bit of pull to pull it through the N95, and it's not pleasant to wear it for the whole day. Um, those exhale valves are great for the user, but they don't protect the patient at all. So if, they, right. if, the, if the hygienist or the dentist is uh, asymptomatically positive, they'll just be breathing that straight onto the patient. So those valve masks are not generally recommended. The reusable ones, a lot of them have valves too, those big, um, yeah. you know, the yeah. one with the filters on the side. So people um, have been putting like a, a class three or class two over. Over top, right. Is yeah. that effective, do you think? That's yeah. It probably does add a, a safety layer. If all you can get is those ones to put to put a droplet mask over it to at least catch catch the mm -hmm. droplets um, mm -hmm. to protect the the patient from the user. Sorry, that was a little tangent, but a lot of people don't talk about that. It's a good tangents, important tangent. So I appreciated it. Um, so in terms of PPE, uh, you know, for the longest time, N95s that was the rate limiting factor uh, for uh, dentistry and it's increasingly becoming uh, the gowns that are um, the, the most scarce commodity, particularly because some provinces now have, have made um, N95s optional and have said that a face shield with a droplet mask, like you said, a class three um, mask underneath the face shield is an adequate um, uh, replacement. And, you know, I've seen research uh, that questions whether, uh, you know, for non-airborne diseases, an N95 is any more um, effective at preventing transmission than class threes. And, I, and, and that research has been actually um, cited in some of the uh, regulatory colleges' uh, back-to-work documents. Um, so in, in many provinces, the, the burden of the N95 has now been replaced by gowns. Are gowns a commodity that have been difficult for, for hospitals to um, uh, procure, in your, to your knowledge, and are there uh, similar strategies for trying to um, maximize the, the uh, effectiveness of those masks, of, of the gowns, let's say? Yeah, so gowns, uh, it's been a problem for some places and, and a little bit less for others. So there's two main types of gowns that are used in healthcare. Uh, there's uh, disposable gowns and then there's mm -hmm. laundered gowns. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would say half the system is on laundered level two gowns mm -hmm. and uh, half the system is on disposable gowns. And the disposable gowns, I think we're probably on the cusp of hitting a wall um, mm -hmm. within the next uh, week or so. And mm -hmm. so I, I, think, uh, I think that there's been a big push to try to um, procure a large number of laundered gowns uh, because, mm -hmm. you know, at least they don't end up in landfill. So I think that's, that is a good, a good strategy if you can get them, although it's actually very hard to get them now. Um, the clothing companies aren't selling anything else right now, so it makes sense. Right. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I think Canada Goose had said that they're going to start making gowns. They are. Yeah, they've started. I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't actually seen them come off the assembly line yet, okay. um, but once they start to roll, like the, the, the visors now are pretty easy to get, uh, relatively speaking. So hopefully the laundered gowns will eventually start to, to come. And if you launder them, it's not, you know, in, in hospitals, we don't launder them in home laundry machines. Like these are industrial um, laundering mm -hmm. facilities. And, and if you're in a clinic, you can contract it out to an industrial laundry facility. And I don't think there'll be any issue with capacity. All the hotels are closed um, yeah, that's down anyway. That's true on the dry cleaners um, as well. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, if, if you put it through industrial cleaning, there's no issue. It doesn't need to be handled in biohazard. It can just go through a regular industrial uh, launder cycle is, is fine with, uh, with detergent. Um, on the disposable side, um, you know, there, there have, and this is really off label, so I'm not encouraging anybody to do it, but we, we, if you, we, we've done it where we put, uh, level two, level three gowns, level one gowns through, uh, autoclave cycles. We have big walkthrough autoclaves, right? Like big, big. Wow. Oh, that sounds um, large. <laughs> and, uh, and so they actually come out very nicely. Um, it's hard for us to tell whether, whether it impacts on the, on the, uh, or like we don't do ASTM testing anymore. Um, I, I think it would be better than nothing, but uh, you know, some people are saying that Health Canada needs to get involved in these types of things. Mm -hmm. um, so ultimately my hospital is on laundered. I've been doing this more because the long-term care facilities are running out and uh, right. something is better than nothing. Yeah, well, I mean, I would imagine in a small sort of dental autoclave, jamming it in a, in a little 
uh, bag might not work as well as in your large walk-in auto. So. Yeah, yeah, no, there's a whole cycle. Like, like we have these big laundry bags that are autoclavable, and like it, it, there's a whole system to to plan on. Uh, you know, ideally, the launderable, reusable ones will show up just in time, like Superman. But if they don't, oh, let's hope. Let's hope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, if if some dental offices uh, bring their uh, gowns to the hospitals, is there any chance we can get them reprocessed? Or <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. I'm, I'm saying, saying it in jest, but only uh, half half in jest. Yeah, well, I mean, we can we can do our. When you're doing it for other people, there's there's huge liability issues. But I think um, yeah. you know there are these big sterilizing companies. Um, I don't know where it'll go with with the Ministry of Health and stuff. I think they've heard on the radar that people are talking about it, so hopefully they'll weigh in. I think they realize something's better than nothing, too. Something's going to be done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, clearly it, it kills virus. The question is, um, is is the fluid resistance still the same after it's gone through the cycle? Um, and uh, and and you know, the, the philosophy of something is better than nothing. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know. Governments tend to be very, and regulators tend to obviously be very um, cautious. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so since you mentioned uh, the virus again, I thought maybe we would uh, uh, jump back to um, uh, the more m micro uh, bi biology side of things. And um, you know, I've heard the word, the term "viral load" used a lot, and I don't think quite frankly, that I fully understand it now. For me, you know, I, someone's contagious or they're not contagious. Um, you know, if, if there's virus in the air and you inhale it, then you'll, you could potentially catch COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> but I've also been learning that that might not be the case, that there may be some sort of a threshold, um, you know, where everybody might be different as well. Like, what is the importance of viral load? And, you know, maybe you could tie it into the question of aerosols or droplet or, or, or what have you. Yeah, so there's a couple of contexts I, I think that are sort of blended together there that you talked about. So, so yeah. viral load, viral load usually is talking about like if I'm infected, my right. viral load <clears throat> is mm -hmm. how much virus I have per mil of whatever body fluid. So viral load, for example, in HIV in in the blood, it'll say you know before you get treated, you may have a million copies per mil, um, and then once you're on uh, highly effective antiretroviral therapy, maybe we'll get it down to undetectable or 50 copies per mil or you know, whatever detectable now is probably below, say, 20 copies per mil. Um, so that's the, the load of the virus in that fluid. So if we translate that to COVID, it would be how much, how many viral particles do I have in my saliva? Is it, and you can quantitate it or you can just say it's low, medium, <laughs> high, like some, some, some people's saliva are like teeming with virus, some just has a little bit. And, uh, and so, you know, the concept of super shedders, I don't know if you've heard about that, but yeah. um, super shedders is, you know, on average, the r not the communicability factor of one person transmits it to about two, two and a half people. But these super shedders, um, one person may transmit it to 30 people or 40 people or 50 people, wow. either because the procedure that happened or just because they're just teeming with, with virus for some reason. And, uh, and so very, very communicable. So that's on the viral load on, on the on the individual host side, on the host side, but on the on the uh, the susceptible individuals side, um, you're it's not exactly viral load. I would call that the infectious dose, and okay. the infectious dose is also variable. So, um, for example, uh, for Shigella, which causes uh, you know infectious diarrhea, bloody diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Um, the infectious dose of Shigella is unbelievably low. You can have one to ten bacteria will cause um, wow. will cause Shigella, Shigellosis, or or dysentery. And uh, on the other hand, uh, if you look at Salmonella, which also causes uh, diarrhea, not often as bloody, um, but also foodborne disease, the infectious dose there may be a hundred thousand bacteria. And part of that is because you eat the food and your stomach acid kills them, whereas Shigella somehow is not touched by that. Wow. Um, and so, you know, norovirus, which is super contagious, all of us who've had this 24-hour stomach flu in homes, right. you know, when it gets in, everybody gets it. to 100% of people get it, has a really low infectious dose. Yeah. Um, and, and so COVID, my, I've been talking about COVID 
as being a mix between influenza and norovirus. It sort of behaves like flu, but it's catchy like norovirus. It's, it's, it is really catchy. These, these outbreaks in long-term care and, and some hospitals, it's, uh, it's tricky. People, there's, not a, there's not a big fudge factor. Like you really do need to be uh, really diligent with your PPE and cleaning of the environment, cleaning of the medical equipment that, share, that goes between rooms. There's not a big safety factor there. So I think the infectious dose seems, anecdotally, seems to be pretty low. Yeah. How do you even study, I mean, how do you study the infectious dose? This is way off topic, but I mean, uh, I feel like there's ethical issues in a human of, here, take, take one virus <laughs> yeah. in a week. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I suspect for Shigella and, Campyl and, and Campylobacter and, and Salmonella, probably there were some of those unethical studies. Then. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot you could do 50, 60, 70 years ago. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I don't think anybody's going to, going to uh, do those same studies um, now, but you know, there, there are ways of hinting at it. Like I think um, there were in some of the, some of the jurisdictions like Singapore and others, uh, South Korea, where they had better tracking systems and they were monitoring phones and things like that. Um, they managed to figure out that um, the way what they couldn't figure out how somebody got it. And then they actually figured out that they went to church and sat in the pews in the same spot that a case had been in prior to them being there. They, they never actually crossed each other in person. They just sat in the same spot. Um, so presumably either they were shedding like crazy or it's not a very high infectious dose, right. but um, yeah. yeah but with, fo with fomite though, I mean, I, I guess I don't fully understand fomite, but if, you know, somebody's singing in church, let's say, yeah. you know, they're singing moistly as uh, <laughs> we say in Canada, um, and then you put your hands on the pew in front of you, you know, that you could get um, a dose. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think this wasn't one of those situations where they were in the front row with the choir. That's also been described. You're right. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, th there's no way to be a hundred percent sure. And I don't think they're going to do, you know, what, what they can do is animal models. And actually they're, they're going to get into those animal models where they actually do grow up virus in the lab yeah. and you can actually dilute it down to get, you know, one copy per mil, 10 copies per mil, a hundred copies per mil and actually try to infect macaques and things like that. And, yeah. and that's how they get a sense because they have the same receptors, very close to the same receptors as humans. Yeah. So yeah, they don't, they don't do them in humans, but they do do it in animals, unfortunately. Well, I mean, it's a relief that they don't do them in humans, but it's uh, made science, uh, getting, getting answers also uh, takes more time now. Um, and macaques, yeah. unfortunately, probably aren't happy about it. Um, so, should we be holding our breath for a vaccine? Is that like, is that the be all and end all here or? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we need a vaccine to be able to start going back to normal. And even once it comes, you know, they have to produce billions of copies, billions of uh, doses. And so, it, you know, it needs to be safe and they need to prove that it works and all of these things. So realistically, this is, this is not, uh, not likely to be highly rolled out this year if at all it's going to be a next year thing yeah um and uh yeah i think i think we are waiting for that the other option is that we start to build up more immunity in the population but you know when you see the waves that happen in new york and it's only sort of 15 percent of the population that's uh those are pretty pretty impressive waves in new york. Yeah. yeah yeah have there been any do you know um and i know you've been extremely busy with your hospital um uh and long-term um, uh, care homes, but have you have you heard of any outbreaks in dental offices of COVID nineteen yet, either from a patient to staff or, or from staff to staff? I, I I haven't seen it reported. Um, I mean, I do I do monitor most things dental because we do have an interest in it, sure. and as things ramp back up, but um, you know, I, I think there's been such large and impressive elsewhere, and it is a community spread disease that. If you did have one office with a transmission, it probably wouldn't make it into, you know, the MMWR and the CDC or, or the newspapers. When you have, you know, meat processing plants that have 2,000 people, um, yeah. like there's some very impressive outbreaks and, yeah. and single clinics. The other thing is, you know, it's not the easiest thing to tell who gave it to who and where um, because it's a point in time and the incubation period of the virus is, you know, between two and 11 days and they say, you know, they round that to 14 days. So it, you can never say with, with certainty which 
you know, some dentists may hear me say that and say, oh, well, then they can never attribute it to the clinic for good. Um, but that, it's actually the opposite because anybody who's come to the clinic, public, public health will probably come knocking and then start, you know, looking in drawers and pulling open cabinets and sort of seeing how your process is, looking at your manuals and your staff training. Right. Um, right. So that they will They're already calling practices. Calling. So yeah. I, I have yeah. know that they've been calling practices because it's, you know, as you get back to business, people have COVID-19, people go to the dentist and whether there's yeah. any correlation there, that's part of the investigation for sure. And yeah, so, exactly, exactly. And so for, you know, what I've, what I've been trying to emphasize is, you know, part of the reason it's so important not only to do these things for the safety, but when public health calls, you need to be able to tell them, here's, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, this is what our staff is doing, this is the training we've been providing, this is the PPE, yeah. and this is how we're uh, managing social distancing, this is how we're cleaning and turning over the operatories, so that public health will say, oh, you're doing great. <laughs> Keep yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I know, I mean, we've worked, we've worked with you guys, so I yeah. know that you understand, but maybe we should emphasize for everybody else, because yeah. I know the two of us understand that it, it's, it's not just saying this, 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 it's right. saying this, 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 and here's the proof. You know, we right. trained them on this date. We had right. this, we had this uh, PPE donning and doffing session with all of our right. staff. We had this education session. Yeah. We've here's implemented, our logs. Right. you know, we've had this engineer come and assess our HVAC system to tell us this is the air exchange, which is why we're waiting this number of minutes as opposed right. to this right. many hours. Um, right. So, um, it, in Ontario, it's not just, that's uh, not just the word, right? It's, right. It's actually, no, absolutely. No, I mean, and, yeah. and we have, and, and i so glad you said that um, because it, it's so important not only to say it, to do it, to, to live it, but also, I mean, you know, uh, environmental cleaning logs now are yeah. so critical. So when they say, you know, this patient was seen at X uh, o'clock on, you know, Wednesday, you can say, okay, well, you know, we, we cleaned the operatory right afterwards and we have the person here who, who turned it over. Um, you know, we didn't have a patient in there for so long. Um, and we also, you know, here's our environmental cleaning log for the reception and for, you know, the bathroom. And, uh, you know, we we did all of that, uh, you know, before other patients were in the area. Because the last thing you really want is for them to start calling patients. <laughs> I mean, and so you have to be able to show them, there, you have to be able to show them there's no need to. You know, we've, we did everything we possibly could. Um, you know, uh, to ensure that there's no patient to patient, patient to staff transmission. And so, so important in the logs and the, the recording, it actually happening is um, uh, 100%, uh, I think, a great take takeaway. I mean, we've been going for a while now. Uh, so, yeah, you, you may have to split this into two sessions. I, I think, yeah, that's I think my we, fault or your fault. I'll blame it on you, though. It's definitely my fault. Um, and, and it, uh, Maybe it was a little bit selfish of me to take up so much of your time on a long weekend Saturday evening. Uh, but I want to thank you. I don't know if there's anything you want to say, uh, any questions I should have asked, um, but now is your opportunity to do that. Yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, I think we covered a lot of things. There's obviously yeah. a, lot of, a lot of literature out there, um, but I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't underestimate and I wouldn't minimize uh, the fear um, and a lot of a lot of the stuff that you do through your compliance units, all the stuff we do in clinics, is you know the training, the education, the on-site review where the staff can ask experts. Um, it, it goes a long way to bringing some of those fears down. Um, it doesn't make them go away. I, I mean, I wish no, it did. No. I, I wish it did, especially with COVID. Um, but but all of these same things, you know, around public health and the Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Health and all these crazy things. Um, now more than ever, you know, a lot of people were concerned about these audits around sterilization and like, yeah. it's just going to be at a whole different level is my expectation as we, as we move forward. Um, and if it wasn't just because of the patients, it's because the staff are going to be calling these regulators. Um, they they oh, do it at the hospital. They're going to be doing it in the clinics. Um, and, and minimizing it is not a good strategy, I would say. Um, I think, I think engaging and, yeah. and trying to take it to the highest level of, of safety is probably the right a way to keep staff, to keep them confident, to yeah. keep patients and keep them confident. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank you one more time. I want to thank the audience who was with, with us uh, this evening. Uh, once again, my guest was Dr. Kevin Katz. Um, go to practicehealthcheck.ca. Uh, what will they find there, Kevin? Um, what they'll find, I mean, it sort of describes what our, what our, uh, services are. Um, I, I, uh, 
I, I have a partner, so I can't tell you if all the COVID stuff is on there, but we have a full COVID manual. Our staff are all certified infection control practitioners. They know about COVID. They came from hospitals. Some of them worked in public health in the past. Um, they work in dental clinics, so they know everything dental on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, they can call your team for, for <laughs> references. We work very closely. Yep, with them. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Provide a reference, a glowing reference. Well, that's great. Um, uh, once again, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Stay safe. Stay strong. Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, that's it from Dental Corp. And uh, have a great evening. Take care. Cut. All right. That's it. <laughs> Are we good? It's still yeah. recording. Oh, hold on a second. Yeah, I'm still recording. So that part, I'm still figuring out what to do here. Uh, record.